Uh, thanks everybody and it's a good opportunity for me. You know, I'm honored to be here to share my knowledge about tsunamis. So I'm gonna show a, f a short video clip, two parts. I'm not gonna show all of it and I hope it doesn't destroy your appetite because <laughs> <laughs> so these are actual footage during the event of 2011 in Japan coastal area so that's the front of the tsunami approaching the coastline He's saying he's just rolling towards the beach and now listen what he's saying after this. One, two, three or four more is coming in. Okay. Sorry? Okay, uh I'll have to pull this. <laughs> Oh, it moves that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, that works. Okay, the next video I'm going to show you, you know, we go to the pool, we go to the beach, you go to the swimming pool. You take a swim, and you, we don't really feel the power of the of uh, the waves or the water. So I'm not going to show all of this, but I'll show you a certain clip here. Here. The water just keeps coming in. It crushed the whole building in the middle. You see that black wall? That's actually a wall along the coast of Japan to protect it from tsunamis. They built the wall for that purpose. But for this event, the wave just overtopped the wall. So that's how strong the waves are. So now we've seen how devastating a tsunami is once it comes to the coastline. So there are basic questions that we, we ask and the information that we know. First, we have to know what's a tsunami and how is it generated? Can we predict a tsunami is a useful question that we ask. And other, when I talk to this with uh, kids, they always ask, can you stop it? And how can we prepare for it? And most of the common questions they ask is, will it happen here? So it's the same question as an earthquake. Will an earthquake happen here? And my usual response is, the main question is not whether it will occur, but when it will occur. Okay? So let's go through first, these first few questions. So tsunami, some terminologies, it's a Japanese word meaning harbor waves. This works. I'll oh, stand up. Am I blocking anybody? No. Oh, okay. Oh, this is. I can keep dancing around so I can, you know. <laughs> okay. 
So a few misconceptions is that people would either say tsunami or tidal waves. So tsunami is not tidal waves. So what tidal waves is when you go to the beach, you see the tide gauges. You see if you stay the whole day at the beach, you see the water coming up. And then after a few hours, it goes down again and up and down. Now that's not a tsunami. That's what we call the tides. So the tides are actually the effect of the moon's gravitational pull on the earth and the sun. So that's not tsunami. And all these Hollywood movies show you one single wave coming in. It's not. As you saw in the video earlier, can you see this? There's one, two, three, four, and more waves coming in. So it's not a single wave. And some terminologies, I won't get too technical. So we have a term we call wavelength and wave period. So if you look at the time series here, this black line is an actual data that we recorded for the Japan event. There's the first peak, the, the waves you see at the beach that comes up, and then another one comes, the higher one. So wavelength is the distance from that peak to the next peak. And wave period is the time the second peak hits the place where the first peak is, okay? And what you see at the beach normally are what we call wind waves and some other waves. The length, the wavelength for those wind waves are usually 60 to 150 meters apart, peak to peak distance. And the period between those peaks are about 10 seconds. The difference with tsunami is that it has a wavelength of 160 kilometers or greater. It's 160 kilometers long between two peaks. And the time for one peak to arrive could be five minutes to one hour. So if you're in the deep ocean, you cannot see a tsunami coming because the wavelength is just too far apart and the time it takes for it to come up and down is just too long. So once you're in the boat, all you feel is just the normal waves for your boat to come up and down. Next terminologies, uh, you might hear this when a tsunami event happens are inundation and run up. So how to describe these two terms? So let's say this is your shoreline, that's your beach, and that's the sea level, and then the tsunami waves comes attacking to the coastline, and the maximum extent it reach the coastline, you m we mark that the horizontal distance from that point all the way back to the shoreline is called inundation. That's how far horizontally the water went in to the shore. And the distance from here, from the sea level, all the way to the point where the inundation hit, that's what we call run up. How high the water reached land from sea level. So one of my former professor told me it's very easy to remember between the two terms. You run up. <laughs> so that's vertical. <laughs> so inundation, you don't get confused. Just say you run up, that means a vertical distance. So it's easy to remember. Now we go to these are basic terminologies and concepts. And now what generates a tsunami? There are four sources, an earthquake. This is the best example I can show in an earthquake because I can't show an earthquake which is underwater. So I'll just show you one that's you know without water, right. A landslide, if it's strong enough, that can generate a tsunami. Volcanic eruption can also generate a tsunami. And as the movie showed, meteor impact can also generate a tsunami. But the most common one is the earthquake, okay? Example of volcanic eruption was in 1883 in Indonesia, Krakatoa. That a very big volcano erupted and there's been historical records showing at, I think a town close by had uh, 46 meters of wave coming in. And then there are some historical records I read that the sound, the volcano erupting, was heard all, of, all over the world. It just went around the earth. But what we're focusing here is the earthquake. So for earthquake, typically occurs if you remember tectonic plate theories where we have different plates floating and it's moving. So typically it occurs in the subduction zone. We call it subduction zone because one of the plate, example here, is going down into the earth. While this plate here, the land part, 
is trying to resist it. So what's happening is every year, there's a, if you search online, there are some maps that tells you how much movement we have, how many millimeters are the plates moving in which direction. So as the ocean plate goes under land, it's trying to push it, while the land one is trying to resist it. And once the land part cannot resist it anymore, it breaks, it moves up. So that movement can generate a tsunami. So you have a vertical displacement of the water. It's just like you have a tub of water and then you push the bottom. You see the water surface come up like this and then the waves ripple away from the source. So here's the source. The water is pushed up, and then it goes in all directions, towards the shore and away from the shore and also sideways. So what's happening here is that you have this water being pushed up. You have all this energy moving in the ocean. So it keeps moving, and then you come to an area where the water depth becomes shallower and shallower because you're coming towards the shoreline. So you have all this energy moving. And the energy is almost con always conserved, almost 100%. It loses some of its energy, but it's always still like almost 100%. So you have this water depth, water is moving, and the, the water depth gets shallower and shallower. What's happening is it has nowhere to go. It has to go up because the, all the energy is stored. It doesn't lose its energy. So that's why when you go to the coastline or the tsunami goes to the coastline, the waves become higher and higher. And how fast does it run? Or how fast is a tsunami? So the tsunami speed is computed by, this is only mathematics I'm gonna show here. <laughs> <laughs> Square root of GH. G is acceleration due to gravity, so a reminder of all our science. And H is the water depth. Now, if you put the average water depth in the ocean is 4,637 meters. You put it in the equation, 4637, Acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. You multiply that, you take the square root. That's 213 meters per second or 477 miles per hour. So how fast is that? The maximum cruise speed of a Boeing 747-400 series is 571 miles per hour. That's how fast tsunami moves in the deep ocean. So the tsunami in Japan hit Hawaii probably about six or seven hours after the earthquake occurred. And since the, I don't have an image here, since the earthquake was so close to Japan, the tsunami arrived the coast in 30 minutes for Japan side. So they only have 30 minutes. Now, we have some background on what causes a tsunami, how it's generated, some basic information of tsunami. So what can we do about this one? It goes back to the question, can we predict it? The same question is, can we predict an earthquake? We can't. At this point, we just don't know when an earthquake happens. The advantage with the tsunami is, we know it will happen after an earthquake. And depends on how strong the earthquake is, it will generate a tsunami. So the difference with this area here, these are all subduction zones, and the ring of fire where all the volcanoes are located. And with the one with in California, there's also a fault line. If you remember the diagram I had of the subduction zone going like this, and then it breaks, pushes like that, it's dipping down towards the earth. So this is what we call it dips and slips. For California, the fault line, the orientation of the subduction zone is what we call the strike. The strike, if you look at the surface of the earth, what direction is the strike? Zero towards north to 360. The difference with California, the fault line is when the earthquake moves, it mostly goes like this, horizontal. There is a slight vertical component, but the vertical component that causes the water to be pushed up is not as big as with the subduction zones, which is pushing the entire water column. So that's why when we have earthquake in California, there's less chances of generating big tsunamis. So when earthquake happens, <coughs> how do we detect it? So we have these dark buoys. It's a deep water assessment and reporting of tsunamis. 
We place it all over the world. I'm showing here in the Pacific, that's cause what's where we are. All the dots here, regardless of the color, are where all the dark buoys are located. So what does this buoy do? When earthquake occurs, the waves generated, the tsunami waves generated by the earthquake will travel across the ocean. When it passes through the buoy, we have a bottom pressure recorder at the bottom of the ocean can detect those waves. In fact, its measurement resolution is better than one millimeter. So it can detect those waves. Once that happens, then it sends a signal to this relay station, the buoy itself, and it sends to the Iridium satellite and sends all the information to four offices. The office here in Seattle, my research group, and there's two tsunami warning centers, one in Pacific, one in Alaska, and the other one, they store it in a data center. So we detect all this, and our group has developed a forecast system which the tsunami warning centers will be using. So we have all these equations and computer models in the background, and we generate a graphical user interface. So what you see here is the Japan event when it occurred. The b this buoy here detected that one. Once we get the information, we can immediately produce this map. What this map shows is based on our computer modeling, what will be the maximum wave height distribution for the entire ocean based on our model. And this can be generated once we get the information from the DART. This map can be generated in less than one minute. So we can have information, and you can see where the highest waves are occurring. And once we have all this information from the DARTs, we get that, and then we do some algorithm, and then we can run coastal areas where we have the models. We develop models for several coastal areas as part of the project. I think we have 75 in the US, US territories, and in the Atlantic Ocean. And we click here, inundation, then we have the model. Uh, it's hard to see here. So this is Midway, Honolulu, San Francisco, LA. And then we say, okay, with all this information, which I'm not gonna go into too much details, run the model. And the model, we develop it in such a way that you see those time series? We can predict four hours of those in roughly 10 minutes. So when the earthquake occurred, we get the information from the DART, we run the model, it took about 30 minutes for the tsunami waves to hit the DART, we get the information roughly, probably about, I would estimate, an hour after the earthquake, we can get all this information for different coastal areas in the U.S. West Coast, Hawaii, some territories here, and we can give them a prediction on how high the waves will be and how you will be affected. So I developed Midway. So this is a time series that's produced based on the model. And it's saying that based on the model, the blue spots saying that when the waves hit Midway, you will be inundated. And Midway will be inundated according to this image. And in fact, Midway was inundated. And I don't have a figure here right now, sorry, uh, with the government shutdown. So I'm hired, but I work for University of Washington. My office is at NOAA. So I'm not affected by the shutdown in certain aspect, but on Tuesday morning, we have to go there, grab as much as we can, and we have to shut down all our computers. Then I have to work from home. And there are some files that I cannot access right now, which I could have shown you a comparison of the model results with the actual survey of the inundation at Midway. Uh, it's I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's pretty good. So this one, the actual survey showed only a small spot not inundated. So this hit pretty well. And here, most of the areas here were also inundated. And this one, I think, kind of underestimated the inundation. But I would say 80 90%. It got it right. Okay. And I'm going to show. So that's how our system runs. So this is a similar image I showed earlier. So what you see is the maximum tsunami wave amplitude distribution. 
telling you how high the waves will be for the entire ocean. So that's for the Japan event. That's for the Chile in 2010. That's for the Samoa in 2009. And this is for the 2004 Sumatra. So you can see one of our colleagues has started calling this the fingers of God. Because if, if your area is hit by the orange color, then you'll be hit hard by the tsunami. And you notice that for this one, see this spot here? It's a yellow streak. That's going to Crescent City. This one? Yes. So that's the time where we estimated the wave front will arrive. So that's one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, five, six. Hawaii somewhere here, seven, seven hours. And yes, color gives you the height, which is here. And you see for Samoa, again, there's that streak coming in to Crescent City. And one thing I would say, Crescent City is always hit hard by tsunamis for the reason because there's a Mendocino escarpment here in the ocean bottom. It's acting like a guide, wave guide for the tsunamis. So when it passes by, it just goes straight into Crescent City. <laughs> so <laughs> unless we want to scrape <laughs> the entire sea bottom. I have some real estate in Crescent City I'd like to sell cheap. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> so okay, here what I did was uh, I run a global simulation for the 2011, and I did change the color scheme to make it clearer. So you see, this is the Pacific, Indian Ocean, Atlantic. You can see the energy from that tsunami, or not energy, sorry, the waves were still leaking out into the Atlantic Ocean. And see, into the Indian Ocean. So this is a continuation. You see the light colors here. I'm not sure if it's that clear. Yeah. See, it's coming out in this part. So it just goes around the world because it's a huge earthquake. So we can detect a tsunami. We can't predict when it happens. But at least it gives us a way to prepare ourselves that when an earthquake happened, a tsunami occurred, the dark boy gets the data, then we process oral models, run the simulation, and it gives you an idea, gives the emergency management an idea like how high the waves we predict coastal areas will be in Crescent City, how strong it will be, and whether you get inundated or not. Then it's up to them to decide whether they evacuate people or not. But even before that, we also want to prepare for it because we cannot predict it. We cannot predict when it happens. So we have to know in advance what if that will happen. So this got me involved with uh, USGS, the Pacific Island Ecosystem Research Center in the Papahanamaokoakea uh, Marine National Monument. <laughs> Sorry, these are Hawaiian words. So, <laughs> so this is a national monument. It's a world heritage site in these small islands here in the yellow band. This is the world's largest tropical seabird rookery. Okay, so uh, we're trying to study Midway Atoll here and Laysan Island, but I'm showing Midway. So Midway, there's three islands, Sand Island on the west, Eastern Island on the east, and Spit Island in the middle. Here they got some LIDAR data. This is a different way of measuring the elevation of the land. This is very accurate. This is a first LIDAR data that USGS did for three islands and you can see the different elevation which is this is not so clear here but the maximum elevation of midway is only 11 meters I mean for s Sand Island and that 11 meters is just located in one spot uh, Spit Island is 1.8 meters and Eastern Island I think was about seven something the number is covered behind the slide Mean sea level, yeah. All the elevations on the land are measured based on mean sea level. So here's their concern. You know of this 
UN, I think, released a report regarding climate change and all these things. So they're very concerned because with all the melting of the ice, the sea level is rising. So they're concerned with this because with this low elevation, they did a uh, study using a passive sea level rise scenario. You just increase the water level. This is based on mean high water. At the half meter increase, not much effect. One meter, you start seeing the blue on the edges. 1.5 meter, <coughs> there's more water coming in. At two meters, that's what's going to happen with Sand Island. Okay, It's going to lose, the land area is going to lose 39% at two meters. The beach area will lose 71%. Can you say blue, can you permanently? permanently, it's underwater. And there's not much hope for Spit Island because it's per pretty low. Half meter, you see blue. One meter, almost all of it is gone. At 1.5 meter, because that 1.8 meter is just probably one single spot, so everything's underwater at 1.5 meter. And Eastern Island, you see all this data also. At two meters, it's losing 39% uh, of its land area. So they're concerned with all the birds here, endangered species. And they said during the Japan event, a lot of it died. Some of the birds were feeding at dawn and the water came at dawn. So the mother and the chicks were underground and the water just went in. So most of it were drowned. So they're concerned that if we have this sea level rise and then you have this regular tsunamis that are occurring that didn't affect midway before and then you increase the water, how would it affect midway then? So we started the study and what we do is what we call hazard assessment. I run a synthetic mega events, a 9.4. Uh, there's no, you know, it's just synthetic. But the largest earthquake we have so far was in Chile, 1960, which was a 9.5 magnitude. So in all these different locations. And I just say, okay, let's go for worst scenario with a sea level rise of two meters. I'm going to show you two of the sources somewhere here. So this is KI Kuril Islands, uh, no, Kamchatka, in that side of, of the map earlier. Here, KI 1120, source is there. This is 4251, the source is here. So this one and that one. So with the current sea level, with the synthetic event of 9.4, it inundates Midway Island. But if you increase the water elevation by two meters, that's how it will look like for the same earthquake. And for the other case, you have a slight, or not really slight, but significant inundation if you increase the water level by two meters, this is what you get. So there's more inundation coming in. And based from the initial assessment I found, which could be helpful also, is that any sources of earthquake coming from this area will affect Midway. Any earthquakes generating tsunamis coming from this area will not affect Midway. So that's one way of looking at it. So closer to our coast, so I'm doing a study with the uh, Washington Emergency Management Division looking at uh, Ocean Shores and Long Beach. And we do have a case for a Cascadia earthquake which happened in 1700, similar to the Japan one, a big one. So there are two different scenarios that I ran, and I'm using this scenario here, the most updated one I got from them. And this is what you're going to see with ocean shores. So what you see is the map. That's ocean shores. This is the water. And the amplitude is in centimeters. So it ranges from 20 meters positive to negative 20 meters. And that's the time since the earthquake occurred. You start seeing the waves coming in. It's green. That's positive. It starts getting inundated in less than 30 minutes. Then you see the waves going across the peninsula of ocean shores. And that's one hour after the earthquake. And you still see waves coming in 
at around two hours or three hours attacking the coast again. These are waves being reflected along the coast of the uh, U.S. West Coast coming back to attack ocean shears here. That's almost two hours after the earthquake. Now, these are information that the emergency management wants to know because when there's a tsunami alert, you leave the beach, but they want to know when you can go back. So you have to follow the instructions clearly. If they say you cannot go back, that's what they meant because the water might come back again. Okay. <laughs> now, please note that uh, this is not to scare you. This is a preliminary product because we have to update the topography. There's some updates we need to do for this one. Yeah, I'm almost out of time. This is for Long Beach. It's for the same earthquake event. Less than 30 minutes. The red ones are 20 meters wave coming in. Okay. Ah. Sorry about that. So if you look at it, if I plot the maximum tsunami wave amplitude distribution, this is what you see for ocean shores. For the scenario, the one on the left with the big one. The other one, a smaller one, you have less waves hitting the sh uh, peninsula, but still you get inundated. And this is for Long Beach, high waves of up to 20 meters in certain areas. And for another scenario, it's less. Again, these are preliminary results because we have to update the, the topography. So the topography and bathymetry is very important for us. Any changes of that can change the results of our simulation. So in summary, we know what a tsunami is. I've discussed basic concept and how it is generated. And as I said, we cannot predict a tsunami, but we know it will occur when an earthquake happens. But we have a way of predicting it, in, in, in a certain way predicting how much damage will occur on the coastline, how high the waves will be. And can we stop it? Well, you see that Japan, they have this wall along the coast. And my former professor, master professor, uh, Professor Imamura, he's one of the tsunami experts in the world. He told me they built this wall along the, the co coast of Japan. They built it higher to prevent the next one. If they build it this way, this high, over water overtops it. They increase it again, again, the next one overtops it. So he said they have to stop at a certain height because otherwise they're gonna end up with the entire coast of Japan just walls and you can't see the beach. And how can we prepare for it? We can do it by doing hazard assessment. We study it in advance. So that way, like for the ocean shores, uh, what EMD is doing now is there's only one way in, one way out of that peninsula. Seeing these results, what they're doing is look, looking for areas to prepare for vertical evacuation. So they're going to build, as I know, I'm not sure when it will be completed, uh, locations where if there's a tsunami alert, everybody can go to that building and climb up to be safe. That's it.